Hi, thanks for coming along. So um, this will be a fairly interactive discussion uh, and uh, presentation. So we want to cover the work that CERN and Rackspace have been doing together around Cloud Federation um, with the summary of are we there yet? It's a topic that gets a lot of interest from a lot of people. And uh, we want to present some work that's been going on during the last year as part of uh, collaboration together. Um, I think we'll introduce each other as we go along. Um, for those of you that don't know me yet, um, it's been quite a summit so far. Um, I'm Tim Bell. I look after the infrastructure uh, at CERN. Um, I'm the infrastructure manager. So we ask ourselves the basic question of why do we need uh, federation? Um, CERN as an environment is widely distributed. Um, it's about 11,000 scientists, hundreds of countries. Um, nearly every major uh, scientific country in the world contributes people who come to work at CERN for some time, but also go back to their home laboratories in order to be able to then do remote work, remote research, as they're permitted according to their teaching schedules or their other commitments. So the majority of countries are actually based around the member states, those in Europe. Um, that's the, the blue set. Um, but there's also a set of other countries um, that contribute. Um, the US, for example, is contributing a significant amount towards the detectors. And some other countries who are just affiliated with CERN. Um, small numbers, but it's great to see the wide variety of people who all come together at CERN without any political bias. It's simply as a question of understanding and doing fundamental research. So the problem that we have then is with all these people who want to have access to CERN-based resources, how do we go about doing that in a way which doesn't have a massive overhead? So the environment itself at CERN is actually widely separated across the world. So we already have a, a grid. Um, this was set up in the early 2000s and has provided us very useful function during the first run of the LHC. The grid set up in a hierarchical fashion very controlled, with right at the center, the tier zero being CERN, where we record all the data. Around that, gradually increasing numbers, we've got about 12 at the moment, um, recently just added KISTI in South Korea, and then around 150 universities that are around that. So the challenge is that all of these people would like access to resources at CERN, and equally want to be able to provide those resources to people um, in their institutes because from the point of view of the money flow and the skills flow, CERN could not justify putting all of that computing in a single place. So to give you a feeling, um, at CERN, we have around 200 new accounts created every month. And there's a corresponding number of people who are leaving um, and going off to do other activities that aren't connected with CERN who have to be cleaned up. Um, and that creates a set of needs to be very careful that we're not giving people access to resources they're no longer permitted to. But equally, if you're coming to CERN for a period of a couple of months, the last thing you want to do is to spend your first week creating a large number of help desk tickets in order to get access to the resources you need for your job. So we need to have a one-stop shop where you come in, you show your passport, you've given your CERN card, and then behind the scenes, all the resources you need to do your work according to your job role are created for you. So when we look at what does CERN need as we look towards federated clouds, so we have a mixture of technologies that we're looking at. So there's the basic aspects of how do we go about ensuring that people can get access to the resources they want. We need to be able to ensure that where we can take advantage of public cloud resources, then we can do that without having to go through complex changes of applications. So we want the same sort of environment on our public cloud resources that potentially we could be purchasing from external sources. At the same time, we want to be sure that an individual user doesn't get access to the entire resources of CERN. We have to have a structured system that allows quotering and control according to your job role. So you can't have it that a junior scientist in a minor part of the uh, detectors experiments gets given access to the entire resources for that experiment that are intended for doing data recording and data processing. This means you need a combination of both the identity but also the roles to be shared. So within this context, around uh, 18 months ago or so, um, we were having discussions at a similar summit to this. Um, and with Rackspace, and CERN, we found that we are sharing a set of common interests. CERN has a structure under which we can do industry collaboration called the CERN Open Lab. Um, several major IT vendors, Intel, Huawei, uh, Siemens, Oracle, 
and Rackspace and Yandex are part of this collaboration. The aim behind that is to use the extreme computing demanded by the LHC to push the frontiers of IT such that the things that people will need in a couple of years that we currently need at CERN will be available and standard and well tested at that time. So basically we can battle harden using the LHC computing problems as set technologies such that when the average member of industry needs that, we have already got it, we've already got it proven at scale. Open Lab at the same time is also an education vehicle. Um, we have a large number of people coming through under the Open Lab framework and doing short periods of studies with us two weeks to six weeks over the summer. And with that, we then provide them with a set of activities to do around the projects where we're collaborating with industry. So I'll pass over to Chris, uh, with whom we had some very fruitful discussions around Federation. Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chris Jackson from Rackspace. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting in a, a cavernous meeting room in Portland about 18 months or so ago. Uh, discussing this crazy half-baked idea called Federation with, with Tim and a couple of guys. Um, I'm really proud to be stood here 18 months later uh, demoing uh, with Marek the, the stuff that we've done. Um, for the people who have contributed in the room, thank you. Uh, it's been a real team effort. Uh, we're massively proud of, of what we've achieved. Um, but it's really just the start. Um, so a quick summary. We set out in this Open Lab project to explore the feasibility of Federation. We didn't even say we'd definitely do it. Um, what we wanted to demonstrate was Federation between uh, a third party OpenStack cloud like CERN's, uh, Rackspace private cloud, and also our, our public cloud. Um, we've delivered a proven demo for private cloud third party to Rackspace private clouds. Um, and we've got a, a healthy roadmap of activity to deliver the public cloud piece as well as part of our keystone work across the coming months and quarters. Um, so what's it like working with CERN? Um, so if you've worked in the community with those guys, you'd have got a feel for what they are. Uh, they're obviously now formally recognized super users. Um, and they've got a common passion for open source. So uh, at Rackspace, we love open source technology. Um, because we're a service company, we want to make sure that the, the connection you have with our business is based on the quality of the service, not the fact that you can't get the software or the technology somewhere else. Um, so we've had a great partner, a great ally to take some very um, big topics into a community with a very diverse set of ideas and opinions about how to solve problems um, and delivered a piece of code in relatively quick time for something so big. Um, to get a community united around it was a, a really good thing that we were able to do together. Um, we learned a lot about what real big data is, um, not the big data that we all talk about. And from a personal perspective, getting out to geek out in LHC um, during the cold shutdown phases as well, um, was a, uh, a personal geek milestone that I unlocked myself. So why Federate? Um, we've talked before, and if you were in Atlanta last year, you'd have heard Troy talk about uh, the concept of multi-cloud. So the fact that people will need multiple clouds uh, within their environment and their portfolio to serve different workloads because of performance or cost or region, a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, but we also know that integrating cloud into your business is hard. And doing it more than once is hopefully unnecessary if federation works properly. So you can integrate the federated version of cloud into your business and gain access to anyone that supports that method of federation. So what do we want to enable? Well, identity is kind of the starting block. It's the point you have to get through to be able to do anything else. Um, it was probably one of the biggest and most complicated pieces. Um, and we can tick that piece off. Um, but imagine what you could do if you could take a heat template, for example, and define multi-cloud inside it. Imagine if your Glance repository was available to all the different endpoints that you federated together. Um, what if you were starting to talk about business rules and logic that stopped a particular application or workload being spun up in a particular kind of cloud, and you had a, a seamless view of quota management across all those different places? Um, take that one step further, what if you could resell spare capacity in your private cloud? If you were a something that could be federated with, and you were running 75% of your workload capacity, you could sell that 25% off. Um, what if IT in your business became a cost center rather than a cost sink? How does that change your view of how you invest in it? Um, and think about spot trading, like the, the commonality between that and foreign exchange trading 
is really interesting. So the stuff that we're enabling with Sir and the rest of the community right now is hopefully going to put people on that trajectory and start to have those discussions and those debates. Um, I think fundamentally federation completes the democratization of cloud. It makes it a commodity because you're pushing downstream a lot of the complexity of the infrastructure layers. Uh, you're making it much more easier and much more subconscious to use. People have often used that analogy of it's like, it's like plugging a, a plug into the wall and just consuming electricity. Um, I think federation is a key part of getting closer to that kind of that analogy being true. So what are we doing next? Uh, we're actively discussing Open Lab 2015 uh, with CERN. Uh, we'd love to take that proof of concept and extend the use cases into things you interact with in OpenStack every day. So things like heat templates to define how an application runs across multiple clouds in one place. Um, glance image availability to all of them without necessarily taking on the overhead of doing image synchronization between all those workloads. Um, and the idea is then we can be uh, ready to do a demo hopefully this time next year, with some more new and advanced and spangly features. Um, but this doesn't get done by the same guys. Uh, we've had a very identity-centric group this year. Um, we're looking for uh, a wider group of people to come together around other elements, including Heat, including Nova, including Glance, start to share their opinions about how we can take this work and extend it into the different OpenStack projects. That's it from me. Um, Marek, as far as I'm concerned, has been the brains behind this, and he's the person you really want to speak to. Hey, so my, my name is Mario Dennis, and um, well, I work on the at CERN. I actually take care of the all the technicalities uh, of the Cloud Federation, uh, among the other contributors uh, from IBM, Red Hat, University of Kent, and uh, and so on. And then uh, I want to talk more about the technical uh, aspects of the Cloud Federation. So, um, first of all, uh, if we were to to summarize the cl hybrid clouds and the and the cloud federation to one uh, one sentence, I would say this is this is it. So as a user, I want to uh, use my single set of credentials to access multiple clouds and multiple services. So uh, I have one cloud. I want to be able to go into cloud A, cloud B, cloud three, uh, cloud C, cloud D. It's something like you very often have the your Facebook or Google Plus account, and instead of just creating yet another account somewhere else, you just you just click the Log in with your with your Facebook credentials, and then, voila, you have your account. You don't have to. You have one password. You have one account, right? So uh, some basic co uh, concepts from the from the federation, from the from the summit, so something we we, we used for uh, to make it happen. So identity provider. This is your. This might be your corporate uh, corporate LDAP, your SQL database, uh, something where your user, where your credentials and the and the user account is stored, right? This is in your company. This is this is in in your in your organization, and uh, you will not have any more accounts, right? Then uh, you might have some remote cloud, uh, some service provider, which uh, with the trust configured between them, and you could say that okay, it's no problem having yet another account, right? But what if we want to have two clouds, three clouds, four clouds, or even more? So then it might be it might get more complicated to remember the pa the usernames, passwords, and then what 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 happens if there are some um, vulnerabilities and then you just you just need to go and change all the passwords. It's very un, uh, un uh, it's not, not not very useful. So um, single local account start in the identity provider and multiple cloud service. So this is this is where we are aim this is what what we are aiming. So a um, couple of words about the design flows uh, we use. Uh, for Ice House Federation, so the first actually the f first release uh, uh, where uh, Ice House where Federation landed. So we based on open standard Federation protocol called SAML2. However, I would the all the frameworks baked into the Keystone and the whole OpenStack are ready for other protocols like Open OpenID Connect, AppFab, Moonshot, and so on. Um, well, uh, service provider, so something which gives you the what you want. In this case, this is the the, the token, something you can use for boot your machine, uh, create the volume, and, and things like this. This is the service provider. Identity provider is the SAML2 compatible identity management service. So again, so your corporate LDAP, LDAP service, your SQL database, with some software sitting on top of this, which is capable of talking SAML2. Um, it's uh, the next point is very important: that authentication and authorization in this federated workflow is very is split. So um, you have, I mean, identity provider is responsible for authenticating the users. This might be Microsoft ADFS, so Active Directory Federated Systems, IBM Federated Identity Manager, or Shibboleth IDP. And you have service provider, which is Keystone in this in this uh, in this uh, case, which does the au authorization. And this they are not uh, the same. Piece of software. 
Um, it's also very, very, uh, it's also worth saying that the it's only IDP that has all the information about the users, so no cloud. However, um, you may wonder what happens, how can I trace my users when they log in from their, you know, remote organizations, companies, how can I see what the they did, what, what they are doing? So from, uh, from Juno release, your all the events are traced, are, are recorded via the uh, CADAF events. So um, nothing is, uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can still see what your user, user are doing, so we can just, you know, account them, uh, make them make, make them a bill. Uh, speaking about the requirements for if you want your cloud to, to be able for federation, you need at least OpenStack Icehouse. Uh, you need Python Keystone Client 0 0.11, and if you want your users to use the CLI, uh, to use their authenticated workflow, you, uh, you're, uh, you're advised to actually use the OpenStack Client 0 .0 0.5. And um, for some of you, this might be a sad news that um, we have built in federa federation functionalities only for the Identity API version 3, um, so you need to upgrade. Um, uh, speaking about the federating clouds or the services and uh, from the big picture, big picture perspective, so uh, first of all, there's a lot of work, administrative work included, so you need to join or create your federation. Um, usually these are discussions about the, uh, what attributes a certain identity providers will, uh, will provide to other federation members, uh, what are the SLAs and things like this. Then you need to exchange uh, service providers and identity providers metadata. So we need to create a, a two-way trust. So we know who, are, who we, are, we are working with. We know that if somebody just provides us some identity, we will trust this is true. Uh, this uh, this is this is more technical part. So exchanging the the metadata files usually generated, and this is part of the of the SAML2 pr uh, protocol. Then uh, there's one requirement for for now that you need to run your Keystone on top of Apache, along with the um, uh, mod ship or mod open o o OIDC, uh, OIDC um, uh, modules to to be able to actually. Uh, federate your clouds. Um, however, as far, as far as I know, there are plans for actually um, building those functionalities directly into Keystone, but we are not that yet. Uh, then you need to enable your federation extension in Keystone. So this is uh, this is purely work for for the for your cloud admins and uh, for uh, operators. Then you need to prepare your infrastructure. So prepare your projects, domains, uh, prepare your groups, and uh, create and uh, or assign roles to to a certain uh, groups and uh, and projects. So. So something which is not which is not very typical. That usually you just you create your users and then you just assign them to certain roles so they can access or cannot access projects or domains. Here we are working on the groups because later the, the users who will be logging to our cloud and the, who are not local who are not local users they will be becoming uh, the members of certain groups. Uh, and again, a new uh, feature you need to, uh, via the Identity API version 3, you need to add your trusted identity providers. So what peers from your federation you trust. Uh, the mappings, I will talk about later about the mappings. This is, this is a crucial uh, point in the, in the whole configuration and the protocols you want to handle. Once we have our cloud federated, uh, it's time to, to actually walk you through the, the whole federated authentication process. So on the left-hand side, we have our certain active directory, and we will actually use it later in the, in the next couple of minutes. On the left hand, uh, right-hand side, we have uh, our cloud, which uh, and uh, this yellow guy with the glasses is actually me. I'm a Dennis. This is my real account, uh, CERN account. And then I will, by not having the local account in the service provider in this remote cloud, I will be able to actually just behave like I was the local user, just because our certain active directory and uh, this cloud has been federating, so we trust, trust each other. So what I need to do? First of all, step one is like, I need to connect with the, f with the remote keystone saying that, hey, I, I know I don't have local account, but I will, but I will want to uh, use the federated workload, so, um, so then you know, I will get the, the token back. I will then, in the step two, I will be redirected to the, s to the identity provider uh, with the SAML, uh, SAML authentication request, the the next step is that is I will be challenged challenged to, uh, by the IDP my, my my own IDP and I will prove that I am who I claim to be. So um, I will have to authenticate myself and this is and and by saying authenticate this can be the user password credential. This 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 can be uh, client certificates, any authentication method you can think of. This is really up to you and your admin. And this is why the authorization and authentication is actually split. And once I'm once I'm done, I will be presented with the SAML assertion. I'm talking about the SAML because this is something we, we are using actively at the moment. So the SAML assertion is the um, 
structure, uh, structure um, defined by the SAML prot uh, protocol, which uh, includes, uh, among, many other, uh, among many other parameters, it includes uh, description of me as a personality. So this, this might be my login, my email address, my date of birth, uh, my, uh, the buildings I can access, and there's lots of uh, very generic parameters, which mean nothing to the keystone at the moment. But once I get it, I will just pass, uh, pass this, uh, this SAML assertion again to the keystone, and then uh, by applying the mapping rules that had been configured beforehand, uh, the Keystone will actually uh, come up with the credentials. With, so, with the list of the groups, I can I am a member of as this, as this federated user. So, and uh, still, before this operation, be I mean, and after this operation, I can after I boot them virtual machine after I do anything like any other user, there will be no user created in the in this cloud uh, backend. So, every time I um, I mean, this, proce this process will be repeated every time I, I redo all the, uh, all the uh, operations. And uh, once uh, after, after that step, once I, uh, the Keystone actually applies this mapping rules on the, uh, on the, on the, on the SAML assertion, uh, I will be granted with the Unscope Federated token. So where the body of the token will actually have all the groups I, can I am a member of uh, after, after, after this, this, uh, this authentication. And the next step and last step is to just scope the token to project or domain, given uh, given you are eligible for that, and then use it like uh, just you know, boot the machine, whatever you want. Uh, after each uh, operate, uh, after each each step, uh, the kind of uh, event not notification will be will be emitted. So this will this will help you to to actually see see what the users are doing and the and the if they are trying to do something bad or not. Uh, um, real life use cases. Um, uh, Dragspace has built a private cloud for us, uh, just to f just to give us a feeling of the real test bed, so we don't have to play on the virtual box machines because you know, we wanted to go somewhere more into the real environment. And uh, I have prepared a short demo for you. So um, before we 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 show the demo, so um, again on the left hand side we have the CERN Active Directory. Uh, we use the our Microsoft ADFS. Um, uh, set up, and the uh, on the left on the right hand side there is a there, there's a small small uh, there's a pri private cloud built by Rackspace located somewhere in London I think, yes Kevin not so but it's London and um, for the demo uh, requirements so we have I have prepared some uh, projects developers. Uh, groups developers, and if you are a member of a group developers, you can access uh, uh, project developers. And so far, there is only one uh, local admin at the moment, a uh, local user called admin, and he is by default by uh, by by the configuration a member of the group developers. Uh, there is no y there is no me in this cloud. There is no local user here. Uh, the left hand side, there is just me, Ma Dennis. and uh, and uh, we I have also configured the trust so federated. Identity provider and the service provider, and by saying uh, trust among uh, apart from the configuring the shibboleth, which is out of the scope of this uh, of the stack, I, I I configured the identity provider called CERN. I added the mapping and named it CERN, and uh, added the protocol and named it uh, SAML2. So it's uh, time for the video. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So on the there are you can you can see two terminals on the on the right right hand side is the public cloud admin so the local user on the left hand side you, you will see the the all the operations from the from the from my perspective so the uh, user uh, send user and uh, as you can see I'm uh, the local the, the admin will be trying to will be using the token scope to the product developer and he's using his standard uh, v3 password uh, authentication plugin so he just uses with his uh, with his user and username and the uh, and password, so we can see that there is no local user called Ma Dennis. I will I will show it explicitly. OpenStack user show Ma Dennis, and OpenStack gives us gives us the the nice error. So far uh, at the moment there is no identity providers configured. We will do this in the second. So it's empty. The list is empty. So and uh, some proof that um, we are using the same cloud actually. Uh, for uh, the as a user, um, an user, yeah. So 
uh, yeah, I, I also had to s I, I also had to show the uh, service provider you were at that actually I'm trying to uh, to to burst into into the mm, the remote cloud. So let's see that uh, once the federation is not configured yet, um, I'm not able to actually um, get any token, anything like this. So why don't why don't we just do the quick federation setup? I I'm adding the service provider called uh, service provider called CERN, and just for the better output, I'm just uh, I will just show the uh, ID. Um, I'm adding the mapping. Uh, the mapping rules I will talk about later. Uh, they are stored in the rules dot, dot map uh, dot map uh, file, and the mapping is called CERN as well. And the last part is to add the um, federation protocol. Uh, which ties the identity protocol, so identity protocol called, cer called CERN, uh, mapping called CERN, and let's call it SAML2, and as well just nice output in instead of big uh, tables. So wo once again, uh, now we can see that we have our identity provider configured, and the magic is happening. So now we can see that the uh, user is able to get a token and scope to the project um, developers and after that user is user is able to list his images um, he can actually uh, boot a virtual machine and what is really worth noticing here is that um, I I made it show here so the name of the machine is the fed one but the user ID is the MA MA Dennis and uh, on the other hand on the on the other side we can see that there that there's still not no such user in the in the database in the Keystone backend, so OpenStack show user show MA Dennis, and voila, there's still error. Yeah, so now just make a proof that actually the users are um, the virtual machine has has booted, and the cloud admin just can give you some insight that we are not cheating. And the users can can just uh, work. Like like he was an, a local user, even though there is no um, there is no one in the backend. So the yeah. So basically, we are just cleaning up the the product developers, and uh, after a couple of seconds, we we will see that there is nothing left. Yeah, just sh shorter proof that there is still no user in Medanis, so no tricks behind. The list is empty. <laughs> um, we we will also uh, smoothly try to to get to the to the power power and the importance of the mappings actually. So uh, so far we have worked on the product developer, and then the the rules I I have configured the rules in a way that uh, my federated user was able to access access only the group uh, the product developer because he became only the access became the member he was becoming the member of the group uh, developers so uh, let's actually see the uh, how pow how powerful this this mechanism is so now I will try to uh, to get a token as a federated user and scope my my token to a project uh, called manager obviously I will fail. But if we change our mapping, which is which takes like five five seconds, no more. Um, in a seconds, I will be able to scope my tokens uh, to projects manager as well as the project de developer. And uh, also, also breaking the trust is very, very, very easy. So, in case you, you don't want to uh, some some other some remote users to to log in more into your cloud instead of just cleaning up the you know the thousands of of, of, of accounts, you can just delete or disable the identity provider or change your mapping rules. And then, within after one uh, actually HTTP call, your users will be not able to 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 log in, log in, log in again. Of course, all the virtual machines and the and other other objects will stay. Uh, 
Okay, so um, there was a lot of a lot of talking about the mapping, and I said this is a this is a key part of the of the whole federation federated workflow. So, uh, to be honest, the the mappings are um, are done in the two steps. So first of all, we are leveraging lots of, of lots of the work to the modules like mod ship, mod mod melon. Uh, and the others, and they do the hard work for us. So they accept the XML assertion. This is u those are su those are usually the uh, quite complicated XML uh, files. They parse them. They validate the signatures. So we are ch so we are sure that actually some I mean no content was changed uh, when the when when the assertion was uh, when the assertion was being tran uh, transmitted. And they also store the assertions into into the environment, and only then Keystone actually parses. Uh, its own environment and applies the mapping rules on, of on it. So how does it look like? So um, uh, Apache modules actually um, do the hard work for us, and they 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 do they come up with the something like the key value uh, key value uh, stores like the uh, uh, and and then uh, the mapping engine just takes the rules the rules configured for such an identity provider of, of your choice. And uh, we end up with the custom credentials. So the user ID, like in in the in the our case, it was Amy Dennis because this is how I configured the mappings. And the groups this his user is a member of. Then, the this data is used for for generating the unscoped federated token. Um, it's uh, at the I, I realized that the the mapping rules at the fir at the first glance may look kind of uh, complicated. However, these are these are not so. Basically, this is a JSON. Uh, make sure make sure this is a JSON when you configure such things, and also the uh, so basically mapping rules uh, are the lists of the rules, <laughs> and each rule has two entries. So um, the local and remote, and in order to be to be granted with the with the local value, you need to y uh, you need to satisfy all the requirements in the remote entry. So uh, okay, the first rule is uh, is very useful, but um, uh, it's it's uh, so it will always map the zeroth attribute from the remote value, and the, this value will be taken from the ADFS underscore login uh, parameter. While the second rule will assign me as a federated user a group called developers only if I if my ADFS underscore dev uh, is equal to ITIOS. This is my, my group, and the end uh, IDFS language is either PL or or, or uh, EN. If I if I don't uh, satisfy one of those uh, requirements, I will not become a member of uh, of group developers. And of course, of course, we can mix uh, such rules so uh, so rules do concatenate. Uh, some characteristics of the ma of the of the mapping. So this is a JSON. This is a list of the rules. Rule is a dictionary. Each rule has a two entries, local and remote. Rules can be concatenated. So this is something I just said. If I have for if I for the for the mapping, I have three rules, three rules, and I am eligible for rule one and two. That's fine. I I will I will be just granted with the groups coming from the rule one and one one and two, not from the uh, rule number three. Uh, at least one rule must map the user ID, and this is extremely important. Uh, this is required for for identification of, of your users. So, and the Keystone actually will uh, will complain if 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 it doesn't find it in the in the in the in the credentials produced by the mapping engine. It will just give you the HTTP 401 uh, unauthorized error. Uh, assertions, so the incoming uh, attributes can be semicolon separated, so like a list of the groups, uh, mapping engine will understand it completely. Uh, you have two mapping keywords, any, any one of or not any, not any of for the positive and negative tests. And um, if you change your infrastructure, so if you change the, the projects or groups uh, of the roles, uh, you should also reflect those changes in, the in your mapping rules, because it will not be, it, it will not, uh, be done automatically. Uh, some good practices, which may be not super clear after reading the documentation or after the uh, uh, some discussions. So uh, first of all, we add the identity provider, we add the the mapping, and they are at the first step they are completely independent from each other. Uh, it's the protocol with that ties uh, a certain identity provider with certain mapping. Uh, so and you can use only one mapping uh, for the identity provider. However, you can use multiple mappings for multiple identity providers, which can be good if you, uh, if, you if, if you are part of the, for instance, Academia Federations, where you, you agree with the one set of uh, attributes uh, issued by the identity providers. Um, also, please 
it's, it, it make one rule for mapping a unique uh, unique username because this is the only ch chance for you to distinguish and uh, to, dis to distinguish between your users, and you don't want to you know become uh, completely an anonymous. And make sure that your, your IDs are user IDs are uh, are unique across your IDPs. Um, in email, maybe uh, it's probably a unique enough uh, uh, entry. So um, identity federation is. Uh it's ready for the production, I would say, but it's not yet perfect. There's a long, uh, long work ahead of us. So, um, uh, so far, we, uh, I mean, if you want to burst into various clouds, you still have to get uh, f different tokens uh, for, uh, for, for each separate cloud. So there's no, so there's no, no one token to rule, to rule them all. Uh, we are um, using the Apache modules, so you need to run your keystone on top of Apache, and uh, uh, you need to have a proper modules for that. Uh, we don't have inter-cloud metering, image sharing, virtual networks, so actually we could just sit down and start working on the federated glance, federated neutron, federated nova, federated every service uh, across the, uh, the OpenStack ecosystem. So that's why I'm saying that there is like a, lot of a lot of work uh, ahead of us. So please come and help with development, testing, evangelizing, documenting, uh, you know, just give us some feedback because uh, we are just working for you. And uh, there are also some uh, next steps we would like to carry on. So since Juno release, uh, there is a uh, there is Keystone to Keystone uh, federation uh, uh, functionality enabled, uh, where we are federating out. So um, we uh, Keystone is, uh, has some extra functionalities, and it can it can work as an identity provider. So with your local cloud, you can just go seamlessly to the other cloud, um, and all the federation protocols are hidden from you as a user. Uh, we. Um there are some plans for enhancing mapping engine, so so it 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 becomes even more uh, powerful, and uh, you can do even more and in a more flexible way. Uh, I personally think that the Keystone client needs a better uh, token handling, so uh, so the, so the user experience is even much better. And actually, there's also there's a time like Chris also said that uh, we could explore Nova, Glance, Neutron, and Heat. That's all um, from us. So please join our federation session today, and uh, starting fr at 4:40, 4 4 4 in the venue called Corot in the Meridian Hotel. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I guess not. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. 